what, what it means to be Adventist. What it means to be ready for Jesus to come. I looked up in a couple of different dictionaries. I wanted to find out what it means to be Adventist. Because here Jesus is talking about when he comes, the end of the world, second coming, he, he describes what his last day people will be like. It's, it's a description of the people that are ready for the coming of Jesus. And this is what he says. God's last day people will be faithful and wise stewards. Faithful and wise stewards. And he says those are the people that are Adventist in reality, that are, that are ready for the Lord to come. So I looked up the word Adventist in the dictionary. One dictionary said this, a member of any Christian denomination that believes the second advent of Christ is imminent. According to that definition, we're not the only Adventist church, are we? There are Baptist Adventists. They believe that the second coming of Jesus is imminent. There are Pentecostal Adventists. They believe that the second coming of Jesus is imminent. We are not the only Adventist church. There, the definition of Adventist is any member of any Christian denomination that believes the second advent of Christ is imminent. Well, I looked it up again in a different dictionary, and I was surprised to find this definition similar to the first, but it says, a member of any Christian group such as the Seventh-day Adventists that hold that the second coming of Christ is imminent. Now, what's the difference between the first definition and the second? The second definition, they, it's almost as though they insert the name Seventh-day Adventist in the definition as though we help define the word. You want to define the word Adventist? Look at the Seventh-day Adventist. Do you want to understand what an Adventist is? Consider the Seventh-day Adventist. I thought, wow, what a, what a nice promotion for them to include us in the definition of what an Adventist is. So I ask you this question, and I'll ask it several times throughout the sermon today. Are you Adventist? Now remember, Adventist not in the sense so much of a church membership, but Adventist in the sense that you believe the second coming of Jesus is imminent and that you are a wise, faithful steward preparing for that imminency of his return, the second coming of Jesus. Are you Adventist? Well, going back to Luke chapter 12, here's what Jesus says in describing what his last day Adventist people are like and also what the non-Adventists that make a profession of faith are like. Look at what he says here in Luke 12, 40 to 47. Therefore, you also be ready. So this is obviously in the context of the last days, the second coming of Jesus, our day today. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? There's the Adventists. Faithful, wise stewards. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, now here's the other side of the coin. My master is delaying his coming. You see, they don't believe that it's imminent. His de he's delaying his coming. They are not Adventist in that regard. They're professed servants of the master, but they're not Adventist. His delaying his coming and begins to beat the servants and to eat and drink and be drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will. You see, they were in the church. They knew the master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will. They were not wise, they were not faithful. They will be beaten with many stripes. That's quite, quite astounding. That's, in that story there, Jesus gives his own definition of what an Adventist is. He, he puts it in the context of this story, this description of the last days, 
And Jesus tells us what it means to be Adventist and what it means to not be Adventist. You can summarize it like this. According to Jesus' definition, Adventists believe Jesus is coming soon and they manage faithfully and wisely all that belong to God. Would you agree with that? From what Jesus just said, that's the description of his last day people, ready for the second coming. They believe he's coming soon, they manage faithfully and wisely all that belongs to God, and they are prepared for the Lord's return. But there are two types of believers in the last day. There are two types of people in the church in the last days. There are the Adventists that are prepared, and there are the non-Adventists that are unprepared. And again, don't think I'm just talking about in the context of Seventh-day Adventists. This is Christian believers who believe that the Lord's return is imminent. Adventists prepared, non-Adventist unprepared. Are you Adventist? Let's go back and look at this sermon that Jesus talks about and gives that description there. Let's go back to the very beginning and get a running start to see what Jesus, how he gets into that sermon, or gets into that description. He's preaching throughout Luke chapter 12 here. But he starts off this sermon, he begins preaching about something different. Let's, let's look at what he, how it begins, starting at Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. We're not going to read every verse, but we're going to read portions of it so that you can understand what Jesus is getting at. He starts off by saying this, A multitude of people gathered together, and he, Jesus, began to say to his disciples, with all the multitude of people around, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. My friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. The hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear. You have more value than many sparrows. When they bring you to the church and authorities, do not worry about how you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Do you see what Jesus, he starts off his sermon, he's preaching about something totally different than the issue of stewardship. He starts off talking about how you need to beware, there's going to be people in the church that will persecute you, there are going to be people in the church that will make life difficult for you, but don't be afraid. Do not fear. Do not worry. The Holy Spirit will be with you. The Holy Spirit will give you words to say. He will be there at that time. So that's the context of what Jesus begins preaching about leading into this sermon he's about to get into concerning stewardship. But it's clear that just as the followers, the genuine true followers of Jesus here in the first century, were, he, he said, listen, you're not going to be popular. If you're going to be a genuine follower of mine, don't be surprised if you are not popular. Not, I'm not talking about being unpopular with people outside the church. I'm talking about being unpopular with people inside the church if you're going to be a genuine true follower of mine. And that lesson directly carries over to us today in the last days of earth's history. Same principle. Don't be surprised in the last days. You're going to be a genuine, true follower of mine. You're going to be a faithful and wise steward in preparation for my soon coming. Don't be surprised if you are not popular, not just outside the church, but inside the church as well. But don't be afraid. Don't, be, don't worry. Holy Spirit will be with you. He starts off preaching about that when this happens. Verse 13, Then one from the crowd said to him, and this is amazing, Jesus is talking about something totally different and all of a sudden someone pipes up and he says, Teacher, yelling up at Jesus, Teacher, tell me, tell, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And when you read that, I think, where did that come from? He's not even talking about that. He's talking about the issues of, of people not being happy with you if you're going to be a genuine follower of Jesus. And they said, you know what? I don't want to talk. I don't want to hear that. I, want, I got a question for you. My brother is not sharing the inheritance with me. Would you talk to my brother and set him straight? That had nothing to do with the context at all. But Jesus takes this point from this man and he's going to do something with this statement. He's going to take it and he's going to turn now and he's going to say, okay, you want to go in that direction? Let's talk about the issues of finances and money and stewardship. If that's the direction you want to go, that's fine. I'm going to take, it, take you there. We're going to go in that direction. And this is what he says to the man. He said to him, man, 
Who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. I don't think this man liked the response, the answer that Jesus gave. You need to be careful, brother. You need to beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. And Jesus begins now going in a different direction from the sermon that he started. And the rest of this chapter now, he's going to be applying to the issues of wise, faithful stewardship. This man had a problem with covetousness. And so Jesus warns him. I looked up the word covetous. Covetousness is a desire for wealth or possessions or for another's possession, a very strong desire for something that you do not have, and especially for something that, does, uh, that, that belongs to someone else, something that doesn't belong to you, it belongs to someone else. Now you know we're at the end of the chapter, we know where this is going, you know, he's starting off here now getting into this sermon on stewardship. We know it's going to end up in verses 40 to 47 where he says, my last day people will be faithful and wise stewards. A steward is simply someone who manages that which belongs to another. A steward is someone who's faithful and wise in tending to and taking care of someone else's possessions. But someone who's struggling with covetousness wants those things for themselves rather than being a wise manager for the one who it truly belongs to. Now it's bad to covet what belongs to someone else. It's one of the commandments. So it's wrong, it's bad to covet what belongs to someone else. But would you agree that it would be even worse to covet something that belongs to God? I, you know, to, if it belongs to God and, and I'm gonna covet that I said, no, I don't want that to belong to God. I want that to belong to me. That would put me then in the realm of not being a faithful and wise steward, would it not? That would put me in the realm of not being prepared and ready for the second coming of Jesus, would it not? That would put me in the realm of not being truly Adventist, would it not? And Jesus says, I, I want my people ready when I come. I'm going to point out some things. I want you to realize I'm calling you to be a faithful and wise steward. Don't covet the things that belong to me, to belong to God. What are some things that belong to God that we as human beings in the last days of earth's history can get sidetracked on and begin to want to covet for ourselves rather than being faithful and wise and trusting God? Well, let me give you an example. Look at this verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? You are not your own. Come on, I think my, you know, I can do whatever I want to do with my body. It's my body. I can treat and do with it whatever. The Bible says, no, you are not your own. You've been bought at a price. Jesus didn't just create us. He redeemed us. He paid a high price to buy us back. And when we recognize that, we are becoming wise, faithful stewards. Okay, Lord, the body that I inhabit is yours. You've asked me to be a wise, faithful steward of this body. The Bible says you've been bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and spirit, which are God's. Who do we belong to? We rightfully belong to Jesus, not just by creation, but by redemption, do we not? So yes, the things we do to this body of ours, we need to do in harmony with what God says. And for example, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And so we live in a world today where the common mindset is, hey, if it tastes good, eat it. If it feels good, do it. Drink, be, you know, grab all the gusto you can. That is not the mindset of a faithful, wise steward who is Adventist in preparing for the soon coming and the imminent return of Jesus. And Jesus loves us enough to point that out. And to say, listen, I'm calling you back to something. I'm calling you to full commitment to me. I'm calling you to be a wise, faithful steward of what belongs to me. And really, when you stop to think about it, how much truly does belong to God? <laughs> Everything, doesn't it? Everything. We are his children, his people. And he says in 3 John 2, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health. That's because he loves us. He's given us instruction. He says, 
your body, your taste buds, everything about you belongs to me. Will you trust me in what I say? Kind of like what I said to the kid's story. Will you trust God and believe in his word rather than what your own body may tell you or other people may tell you? It doesn't stop there. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here, this verse in Romans 12, 1 and 2 combines not just the physical body, but it also talks about the mind. Your thoughts. God says, listen, trust me in the area of what goes on in your mind. Oh, come on. I mean, I can... I can think about anything I want to think about. It doesn't matter, right? My thoughts are my thoughts, and I can, can let them go and run in any direction I want them to go in. That's not what God says. Look at Philippians 4.8. Whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, think on these things. Think on these things. Don't think on the things that tend to drag you down. Don't think on things of the temptations of the sins of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. Don't think about the, the in, injustices that people have done to you in the past. In fact, you'd be better off to forget those things which are behind and press on to the prize of the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. So many people today, though, they want to dwell on all the, the in, injustices that happened to them in the past. And I talked to people sometimes. I said, you know what they so-and-so did to me 30 years ago? So-and-so said this, and 30, 25 years ago they did this. Come on, are you Adventist? Your mind doesn't have to go there. Your mind can dwell on things that are pure and lovely and just and good report. God says, will you be a wise, faithful steward of mine? Even your thoughts are to be entrusted to the hands of God. Are you wanting to get ready? Do you want to be prepared? Or would you rather find out too late that you're not ready for the second coming of Jesus? Look what it says. I found these quotes interesting and I... And I I'm praying about applying them to my life. Believe me, when I say things to you, it's only because it's, it's, uh, I'm talking to myself. These, these little quotes are, are encouraging to me. He who does not control his thoughts will soon not control his actions. Think about that. That is true. As I think about that, I, I know when I have, have let my thoughts and my mind just wander into areas that God says, don't let your thoughts go there, Bob. And I can tell of times when my actions have followed those unjust thoughts. Let the mind of the master be the master of your mind. How about this one? Watch your thoughts. They become actions. And actions become habits. And habits become character. And character determines your destiny. So watch your thoughts. A wise, faithful steward. God says, your body belongs to me. Your thoughts belong to me. Will you put them in the direction that I say? Adventists believe Jesus is coming soon and they manage faithfully and wisely all that belongs to God. And there are two types of believers in the church in the last days. There are the Adventists that are prepared and there are the non-Adventists that are not prepared. Are you Adventist? Let's look at another. Jesus goes on preaching. Luke chapter 12. He goes on in this same direction about being a wise, faithful steward. And he says in, in 16 through 21, and we're not going to look at all, but this is where he tells the story about, uh, the, well, the slide calls him the rich fool. I call him the materialistic farmer. It's the man who is so successful in his, his business that his income grows and grows and grows, and he gets more and more stuff, more and more materialistic riches, and he's building up riches and building up riches, and he says, I gotta build bigger barns. I need more storage units. I need more storage space. And he fills up the barns. He fills up his storage space. And he gets wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. And he does nothing with it. And Jesus says this, but God said to this man, fool, this night your soul will be required of you when whose will those things be which you have, pro then whose will those things be which you have provided? So he so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. He was a rich fool. He was not a wise, faithful steward. He was a hoarder. He was not a giver. He was taking in. He was giving nothing out. He coveted what belonged to God. 
The, the wealth really belongs to God. How can we covet as stewards that which belongs to God? Mark referred to it already in the offering appeal today from Malachi 3. Will a man rob God? You have robbed me, but you say, in what way have, you ro have we robbed you? In tithes and in offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. That's where we get the idea from in the principles of the Old Testament that the Levites, the priests, the full-time workers, employees of the church were to not moonlight. They had to work their full-time job to be the, the, the workers of the, the gospel in the Old Testament church. And that same principle carries over to the New Testament. Bring the tithes in. So that's how they were to, uh, to make a living. That there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord, to see if I will not pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Jesus emphasized the principle of tithing. Paul re-emphasized it in 1 Corinthians 9, 13, and 14, where he applies the, 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 the principle of full-time workers for the church. They live... Uh, from the tithing, uh, the things that come into the temple, same principle. And if we're faithful, wise stewards, if we're true Adventists in the last days of earth's history, we will not be coveting those things that belong to God. Says, God says, the tithe belongs to me. And you're just to be a manager of those things that belong to God. Adventists believe Jesus is coming soon. And they manage faithfully and wisely all that belongs to God, including our financial status. There are two types of believers in the last day. Adventists that are prepared, non-Adventists that are not prepared. Are you Adventist? Maybe you'll be surprised at this. I was surprised. I googled this. I'm going to share with you what I discovered. This is from June 25, 2015. From the Office of Archives, Statistics, and Research from the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, and this is pertaining to United States figures. In the year 2012, the tithe that came in through Seventh-day Adventists in the United States for the year 2012, the total tithe was 2,314,826,800 dollars, according to the Office of Archives, Statistics, and Research General Conference. Offerings, which as Mark pointed out in the offering appeal, the offerings is how the local church budget operates, not on the basis of tithe. Offerings that came in was $961,774,257. And at first when I saw that, I thought, wow, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, that, that sounds like a lot. Until I saw this next statistic. Look at this. You know what per capita means, right? If you take that figure and you, and you divide it per capita by the number of Seventh-day Adventists in the United States, it will tell you what the figure is per capita that each Seventh-day Adventist would have given in that area for the year, okay? Here's the per capita figures. Tithe, $134.72. Offerings. $55.97 per capita for each Seventh-day Adventist member in the United States. The, the $2 billion sounds like a lot, but when you take every member and you break it down to an individual number, $134 per member, which tells me something. Jesus knew what he was talking about when he took all of Luke chapter 12 and he said, my last day people, my Adventist people, I'm calling you to be faithful and wise stewards of all that belongs to God. And that includes not just being a steward of the physical body and not just a steward of the mental capacity of our thoughts not just a steward of our financial situation. It includes that too. Stewardship is much broader than just money. But Jesus is the one preaching this sermon. This is Jesus' sermon. This is not my sermon. Don't find fault with me. Jesus is the one that decided it was important enough to talk about money. And he did. He did so. He started off preaching about something else until the man spoke up and said, Lord, tell my brother to share the... the inheritance with me so Jesus started preaching about this issue right so there's obviously an issue then that Jesus knew would be an issue between profession and actually doing 
actually being faithful and wise and preparing for his coming. Well, he goes on, Luke 12, 22 through 32. Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do you find the good news in all of these verses? Jesus is talking about stewardship. He's talking about finances. And he says, but you know what? God wants to give you the kingdom. Don't worry about your materialistic life as much as you need to be concerned about your spiritualistic life. And just know that God wants to get you home if you will trust him, if you will be a faithful and a wise steward. God's last day Advent people, the Adventists, have a heavenly kingdom perspective more so than an earthly kingdom perspective. Does that make sense? Jesus says keep your perspective on the heavenly kingdom. That's much more important than being so concerned about the earthly kingdom and your materialistic things of earth. Perspective is so valuable here. Now, if any of you know who these two baseball players are, I will give you a gold star. I don't know if you do. Some of you, these guys go back a few years. They go back to my younger days. The one on your left is Tug McGraw. Tug McGraw was a Hall of Fame relief pitcher for both the New York Mets and the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, some of you, if you're into country music, know of Tim McGraw, country singer. Tug McGraw's Tim McGraw's father. In fact, Tug McGraw is the one that Tim McGraw wrote the song about because Tug McGraw died of cancer. And Tim McGraw, his son, wrote the song about uh, live like you are dying. If any of you have ever heard that, it was about his dad dying of cancer, Tug. But the guy on the other side, on the right, I'm an old Pittsburgh Pirate fan. That's Willie Stargell. Willie Stargell was a home run hitter for the Pittsburgh Pirates long ago. Well, he was a big guy, well known for his power. And there was a game that Tug McGraw was called in in the late innings, bases were loaded against the Pittsburgh Pirates, and Tug McGraw had to come in and try to get Willie Stargell out. Everything was on the line, the pressure was high, Tug McGraw comes in, and he has to pitch to Willie Stargell. And evidently, he, he got him out, because when the game was over, all the news reporters got Tug McGraw aside and they said, tell us, what's it like to have to come in on a game like that when the pressure is, is so great and you have to pitch to Willie Stargell? And Tug McGraw looked at the reporters and he said, you know what? He says, when I get out there in this sat situation and Willie Stargell is at the plate, he says, I feel like I do not want to throw that ball. I do not want to throw the ball to Willie Stargell because I know what he's capable of doing. He said, but when I'm standing on the mound and I have to pitch, and, and that's how I feel, he says, this is what I think about. This is the perspective that he had to have. And look what he said. It's the desolate earth theory. What's the desolate earth theory? I think about the desolate earth theory. Someday this entire planet will be desolate, so it is really not that big a deal what Willie Stargell does here with the bases loaded. Think about that for us as Adventist people in the last days when the things of this world, the material things, the kingdoms of earth, want to try to get built up so great that it eclipses the important things of the spiritual kingdom. Someday this planet is going to be destroyed, is it not? We're going to be going home and this planet will be laid waste. It's the desolate earth theory. And we need to keep that proper kingdom of heaven perspective. That's how Tug McGraw was able to come in and pitch to Willie Stargell, that's how you and I are going to continue to go through the last days of verse history as faithful and wise stewards of Jesus. Adventists believe Jesus is coming soon and they manage faithfully and wisely all that belongs to God and there are two types of believers in the last days. Adventists that are prepared and not Adventists that are unprepared. Are you an Adventist? You know, really, the only thing of value of lasting value isn't earthly kingdom perspective, it's spiritual, heavenly kingdom perspective. Jesus goes on, Luke 12, 33 through 40. And again, we're not looking at all the verses. He says, sell what you have, give alms. There he is, give, give money. Provide yourself money bags which do not grow old a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Therefore, be you also ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. That's all leading up to where we started. But again, Jesus is still talking. He's still preaching this sermon concerning money. And then it gets to where we started this sermon, Luke 12, 42 to 47, the parable of the two types of believers in the last days, according to the Gospel of Luke. And I discovered that that story that Jesus tells there, Luke 12, 42 to 47, about faithful and wise stewards and those who were not, it's also recorded in Matthew 24, verses 41 to 51, 44 to 51. Now, those of you who are Bible prophecy students, you know what's contained in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 is that great signs of the times chapter where Jesus says, when you see all these things happening at the same time, you can know when my coming is imminent. You can know when my coming is near, even at the doors. And so I went to Matthew 24 to compare the account of Matthew with that of Luke about the wise and faithful steward. And when I went to Matthew's account, this is what I discovered. Here it is. And by the way, this is how Matthew chapter 24 ends with this, this story. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. It's a different word. In Matthew's account, it's a faithful and wise servant, doulos. In Luke's account, it was be a faithful and wise steward, which was oikonomos. And I thought to myself, well, why, why does Luke say we're stewards? Matthew says servants. What's the big deal? What's the big issue? And I started looking up times about this word doulos, servant. And I discovered that many times the Apostle Paul says this about himself. Paul, a bond servant. There it is again, doulos. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. And then it dawned on me, I realized what Paul was saying. He's saying, it's because of the gospel. It's because of what Jesus did for us. It's because of how, how much Jesus was willing to sacrifice for me. It's because of everything that Jesus went through to save me and to reach me and to communicate the love of God to me. That's why we choose to submit to his authority. That's why we want to be faithful and wise stewards. We want to be faithful and wise servants of Jesus. It's the gospel motivation factor. Otherwise, we hear a sermon about being wise and faithful stewards, and we think, okay, my, I better, I better work harder at this, I better do this, and we, next thing you know, that becomes our work. Paul says, no. Our work is to keep our mind on the love that God has for us, and that's the gospel factor that changes us miraculously from the inside out, so that we don't work at being faithful, wise servants. We want to be faithful and wise servants. It's the miracle of grace. It's because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel motivating factor. And it's because of that factor. We don't mind being unpopular if we can be friends with Jesus. Because of the gospel, we don't fear persecution if we can have his presence in our lives. Because of the gospel, we don't covet what belongs to him because we want to belong to him. Because of the gospel, we don't want what's unhealthy because he wants us to be healthy. Because of the gospel, we don't want to think on bad things because we want him in our thoughts. It's because of the gospel we don't want to rob him of tithes and offerings because he has given so much to us. It's because of the gospel we don't want material perspective because we know a spiritual perspective means so much more and it's so much better. We, it's because of the gospel we don't want to be unprepared for his coming because we want to be genuine Adventists when the Lord comes. Are you Adventists? 
So here it is, it's where we started, this is where we'll end. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master, whom his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. What did the master find them doing? When he came, why did the master make them ruler over his household? There were two things that describe the Adventists that Jesus is talking about here. The master gave them food in due season to his servants, to his faithful wise stewards. And when he does, he, he doesn't bless marginally, he blesses abundantly. He gives more and above that which we're able to use for ourselves, and so there's leftover. And what did they do? They took it and they gave them food too. They passed it on to others. They shared, they gave. They were involved in, in the work of the master. As they received from the master, they now had abundance that they too took that and they gave it to others and they shared the blessings that the master had shared with them. That's what made them faithful. Faithful is, is, is a relationship word and that they received faithfulness from the master and right relationship with him and then that, that thing that made them wise is that they then took as a result of their faithfulness and receiving from the master and they were wise in now sharing the blessings that they had with others. The abundance that they had with others. And they were a part of finishing the work in the last days of earth's history because they're faithful and wise servants, they were faithful and wise stewards. Do you see that? Receiving faithfully, wise in sharing and giving it to others. When you compare that to the other side of the coin now, those who had a profession, but that was it. But the evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. They're, they're not true Adventists. They don't think that his coming is imminent. And they begin to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and will cut him in two, point him his portion with the hypocrites. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Adventists, faithful and wise, were saved. The non-Adventists, the unfaithful and the foolish, they end up being lost. Three traits of the foolish stewards here. Trait number one, there's no urgency. He's delayed his coming. His return isn't imminent. We've got plenty of time. No need to worry. Sit back, relax. Enjoy life. That kind, I mean, that delaying his coming, trait number one. Foolish. Number two, they began to beat his fellow servants. They actually began to fight against those who were doing the work, receiving faithfully from the master and then sharing and passing it on to others. The ones who were not involved with that, they actually worked contrary to what the true servants were doing. They were not concerned about finishing the work. It's their own power. It's their own authority that they were interested in. And they had power and they had authority so much so that they could actually beat their fellow servants. Don't be surprised if in the last days of earth's history in the church that dynamic will rear its ugly head. Jesus prophesied, he told about it here in this story. If anything should come along in the last days of earth's history that goes like this, if you do not agree with my opinion, then you, I'm going to make life hard for you. If you do not agree with my policy, if you do not agree with what we say, then you are wrong. These were people who were servants of the Lord. They received from the Lord, but they had no interest in sharing and passing and doing the work of the Lord. They just wanted the issue of power and authority. And number three, they ate and they drank with the drunkards. What does that mean? They were involved in overconsumption for themselves. They were overconsuming. They were taking it in and they were feeding upon it and they were keeping it and it was all for them and it wasn't for anyone else. They became over, so overconsumed with it, they ate and they drank with the drunkards. They were not involved with being faithful and wise and sharing it with others. Now remember, the term Adventist is a member of any Christian denomination that believes the second advent of Christ is imminent. The foolish stewards 
They did not have that Adventist mentality. Talk about overconsumption. Look at this statistic. Statistics from the U.S. Center of World Mission, Global Mission Statistics 2001. So this goes back a ways, but I'm sure the principle still applies. Christian spending, 2001. They discovered $44 billion were spent by Christians on soft drinks. That's a lot of money. 2001. I would guess it's probably higher than that today. Who knows? $35 billion spent on sports. $12 billion spent on candy. $8 billion, this is among Christians, spent on pets. $5.5 billion spent on video games. $3.4 billion spent on cut flowers. My. $2.7 billion spent on skin care. $1.7 billion given to the church to forward the work of God. Talk about overconsumption. Talk about receiving and becoming drunk, overeating, over drinking, and having nothing to share and to pass on with others. Talk about not being Adventist, being preparing for the second coming. And then it said this, if they had faithfully tithed in 2000, an additional 139 billion would have been gone back to God's work. What a statistic. That brings me back to where we started. If God cares enough about us to tell us, you know what, I'm coming soon. And if he knows that maybe we're not quite ready for his coming, isn't it a good thing for him to take the time to explain to us areas that he says, you're not trusting me in these areas. You're not letting me let you be a faithful wise steward in these areas. I would want to know that before it's too late, wouldn't you? That's the purpose of the sermon that Jesus is preaching here. Luke chapter 12. Adventists believe Jesus is coming soon and they manage faithfully and wisely all that belong to God. There are two types of believers in the last days. Adventists that are prepared, non-Adventists that are unprepared. Are you an Adventist? Final story. There was a, a church who had a missionary come and the missionary was going to get up and speak. Uh, talk about all that he's been doing and then the elder gets up and he's going to make an appeal to the congregation. They're going to try to raise some funds to help the missionary in his work. And so the elder gets up and he explains from his own testimony, he, he shares with the, the church how it will, and oh, by the way, this uh, elder who's giving the, the offering appeal for the missionary was probably one of the wealthiest men in the state. And he goes back from his own testimony, tells the story of a time when he was a young man, before he got started in his business career, he came to church one night, and there was a missionary there, and they were raising funds for that missionary. And he said, and I only had $20 in my pocket. I only had $20 to my name. That was all that I had. I had no other money other than that $20. And when the offering appeal went out to help fund the missionary, I looked at that and I thought, oh my, I, I don't have change. Do I give them all the money that I have? Or, or you know, I can't put the 20 in and, and take a couple of fives out. That wouldn't, he says, what am I going to do? Do I give it all or do I not give anything? And he said, and when the offering plate went by, he said, I put that $20 in. He said, I gave it all. I gave it all to the Lord's work. And he said, and that was the beginning of my life turning around from that point in time Doors opened, I got jobs, and my career took off, and here I am today because of that giving, giving it all to the Lord back then. And he said, and would you consider that as the deacons wait on us with the offering appeal for the missionary offering? And he turned around, and he's getting ready to sit down when a little old lady in the back of the church stood up. And she said, Elder! And he turned around, and he stopped, and he said, Yeah, what is it? He said, Elder! I dare you to do it again. Do it again, elder. I dare you. Listen. If maybe in your Christian life you feel as though you're, maybe you're, you just feel you're not quite as committed as you perhaps once were, I dare you to do it again. Come back to Jesus. Lay it all on the altar for the Lord today. Just say, Lord, forgive me. Come into my heart anew. I want to be a faithful, I want to be a wise steward with everything that belongs to you, Lord. Whether it be physical health, whether it be mental, my thoughts, my actions, 
my finances, whatever, Lord, I want to be that faithful, wise steward, not because it's a work of something that I'm trying to earn, but because I see the goodness of God, I see your patience, your love for me, and I want to respond to you today by saying, yes, Lord, I lay it all on the altar for Jesus Christ. I hope that's your prayer as it is mine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for preaching that sermon in Luke 12. Thank you for caring enough to help us see if we're not ready and prepared for your coming, that you will make us ready and prepared if we will just give you our hearts again now and trust in what you say in your word. Like we told to the children, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Keep our thoughts in the right direction, spiritual perspective, more so than their earthly kingdom perspective, gospel motivated, not works righteousness at all. Please God, miraculously change us. Make us your faithful wise stewards. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for accepting us. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.